This video is sponsored by Crossrope. Did you know that the person with the lower resting heart rate isn't always the person who's going to have the better aerobic fitness? That's because many different things can impact on our heart rate. For example, if you have a higher level of resting adrenaline, then you're actually going to have a slightly higher heart rate, even if your heart health is really good. This isn't always a bad thing. In fact, someone with a higher level of resting adrenaline can actually begin exercise quicker and with less of a warm up versus someone with a lower level. This just goes to show the difficulty in monitoring, measuring and comparing aerobic fitness. But one of the most popular measurements used to monitor cardiovascular fitness, VO2 max or maximal oxygen uptake is a measure of the maximum amount of oxygen an individual can use during intense exercise. In other words, this is the upper limit of your aerobic capacity, and it's very well correlated with overall endurance and performance. In fact, we might consider it to be the gold standard. To me, it's always seemed madness to have someone who goes to the gym and lifts a few weights and then says that means they're definitely fit and in great shape. If you still can't touch your toes, then being able to lift weights doesn't make you instantly fit. Likewise, if you get gassed out going up the stairs, then I don't think you can really call yourself in great shape. This is why I think everybody should do at least something to focus on and improve their aerobic fitness and their cardiovascular health. This is gonna improve your longevity. It's also gonna make you work out better because you'll have better work capacity and you won't get so tired. And it's even gonna increase your energy and alertness throughout the day. So many people want to find this magical elixir that's gonna give them more energy, make them feel less tired. But so few people consider just doing cardio. So whether you're someone like me who's interested in maximizing human performance and getting the very most out of your training, or you just want to improve your general health and energy levels, you're going to find something useful by examining VO2 max. VO2 max is written as ml slash kg slash min, or milliliters of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight every minute. Catchy. Anything around 50 to 60 would be considered a good score, with some athletes having scores as high as 80 or above. An athlete's VO2 max is best measured in a laboratory environment using a mask or mouthpiece connected to a metabolic cart. This then monitors the volume of oxygen inhaled and the amount of carbon dioxide exhaled. They'll then be given an incremental exercise test while levels are monitored. The highest oxygen consumption value recorded prior to exhaustion is considered the VO2 max. For those of you without high-tech lab equipment sitting around your house, there are other options. For example, you can use the Cooper test by running as fast as possible for 12 minutes and then using the following equation to calculate a VO2 max score. You should see that on the screen now. Many fitness trackers will also provide a VO2 max estimate once they've collected enough data. While these scores are not perfectly accurate, they are actually close enough to be considered useful. And as we'll see, no method of measuring VO2 max is perfect. But with training, the aim is to improve VO2 max over time. As long as we have a consistent measurement, we can see those improvements occur. Multiple adaptations impact on a person's ability to utilize oxygen. For example, cardiac output, the volume of blood pumped by the heart per minute, will of course impact on the amount of blood delivered to the muscles. Having more and more efficient mitochondria is also beneficial, as is having a higher hemoglobin concentration and a greater capillary density for delivering the oxygen directly to the working muscles. There are many potential avenues for effectively training to enhance VO2 max. If all you're doing right now is jogging, then you're leaving a lot of potential gains on the table. For example, good old high intensity interval training has repeatedly been shown to be effective for improving VO2 max. Even more effective though, is a hit or aerobic hit. In this form of high intensity interval training, the intensive periods use aerobic exercise. That is to say you run or swim or jog just below the anaerobic threshold the point at which your body is no longer to deliver oxygen to the muscles quickly enough and lactate begins to build up in the blood in response to the switch to other energy systems. And this makes sense. By staying within the aerobic system, you ensure that the focus remains on that system, but you're pushing it to the max, triggering an adaptation response. And by using the interval system, you're able to accomplish more volume, have greater rest times, etc. For those at home, you can roughly guesstimate the correct level of exertion by using the talk test. If you're able to speak in short sentences, but unable to engage in full conversation, you are likely exerting yourself a suitable amount. This likely occurs somewhere between 75 to 90% of max heart rate. Ironically, a lot of people actually perform vanilla hit incorrectly and are in fact already unwittingly performing aerobic hit. 
That's because most people just don't run fast enough during their HIIT sessions to actually go into an anaerobic state. And with that said, some coaches and athletes focus more on the use of supramaximal training and other strategies that train just above the anaerobic threshold. An emerging field of research is focusing on individual differences and how different training methods may work better for different athletes based on their genetics. But as we've seen, there are many other interesting strategies we can use. For example, altitude training. By living and or training at higher elevations where oxygen is less readily available, athletes can force adaptations such as increased hemoglobin, but it's not all that happens. Other factors such as exercise efficiency and mitochondrial function may also be impacted. Inspiratory muscle training, IMT, also sometimes known as respiratory muscle training, is also a valid option. This training uses exercises to target the diaphragm and other breathing muscles so that you can bring in more oxygen and pump it round faster during exertion. This may not only improve VO2 max during exercise though, but it could also be effective at improving brain function and alertness even at rest as more oxygen is delivered to the brain and muscles. You can achieve this by using something as simple as a straw in your mouth and many people swear by it. And breath holding actually provides another way to strengthen breathing muscles such as the intercostals and diaphragm and may even help to teach the body to become more efficient in its use of oxygen. Breath holding is a part of many ancient traditions, but it's largely been forgotten. See my video on Aquaman training for more on this. But coming at this from a completely different angle, it's also possible that blood flow restriction, BFR, might be useful for some athletes. Here, tourniquets are used to restrict blood flow to the muscles. More specifically, blood is able to enter the working muscle, but not as easily exit. This creates local hypoxia, low oxygen, which can stimulate angiogenesis, the growth of new capillaries. Either way, what's interesting about these methods is that they are local in nature. This is key to understand. Adaptations occur both systemically and locally. And so your VO2 max might actually be different for one exercise modality than the other. You might have a great endurance for running, for example, but average endurance for swimming. That's because you might have built lots of blood supply to the legs, but not so much to the arms. There will be some crossover, but the specialist in that sport will perform best. If, like me, you're interested in general all-round performance, then you may do best to look at forms of aerobic exercise that target the full body. A great example is jump rope. While you're jumping over the rope, you're also swinging the arms, thereby creating demand at both ends of the body. And that brings me to today's sponsor, Crossrope. Crossrope makes some of the best jump ropes in the world, in my opinion, and I have tried a lot. This is thanks to the superior spin mechanics that make them feel extremely smooth in the hand, the extreme durability accomplished with a combination of steel and a proprietary coating, and the easy interchangeability of different ropes and more. They don't get tangled up all the time like other ropes, they're just far more enjoyable to use. I genuinely notice a huge difference versus cheaper ropes. There's even a smart rope that will track your performance over time and let you follow along with guided workouts via the app in real time. Best of all, Crossrope also takes the concept of getting a whole body workout even further by providing a range of weighted ropes. The heavier of these allow you to burn more calories and really feel your shoulders and core working during your regular sessions. Combine this with some of the techniques we've discussed here and you can significantly elevate your VO2 max in no time. Best of all, Crossrope offers a 60 day no questions asked trial program. So if you don't get on with it, you can just send it back. And as an added bonus, Bioneer viewers can use code Bioneer to get 15% off their order. Thanks again to Crossrope for sponsoring this video, and now on with the show. Another option, of course, would be to train with multiple kinds of aerobic activity. By combining trail running with swimming or boxing with skipping, for example, your entire system would be better adapted for various endurance tasks. And you never know what life's going to throw at you. This is all before we consider exercise economy. As you get better at your chosen activity, you'll be able to perform it more efficiently and with less wasted energy. While this won't technically directly impact your VO2 max, it will impact on how fast you can move and for how long before the VO2 max is reached. These factors explain why I can easily run 10k in under an hour without giving it much thought, but get gassed out almost immediately during sparring. I'm simply not as adapted to that activity and it's reflected in my performance. And this may be why measures such as FTP, or functional threshold power, aka the maximum wattage a person can produce for an hour, are preferred by cyclists. Unfortunately, there's no easy way to obtain such a measurement for many other sports. Point is, specificity matters here, both in training and in measurement. But if we take a multifaceted approach to training our endurance, one that trains the heart, respiratory muscles, and working muscles themselves, and if we train across different disciplines with multiple modalities, we should see some impressive results across the board.
So let me know what you guys think. Do you guys actively monitor and train your VO2 max? Is aerobic fitness important to you in general? Let me know what your methods are in the comments down below. If you're interested in training that goes beyond just strength and aesthetics, but also looks at things like mobility, agility, cardio, fitness, and more, then you might like my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training 2.0, The Protein Performance System. This is for those people that want all round fitness and who don't want to have to choose just one modality. It comes with an 80 plus page ebook and over two hours of training, and you'll find a link to that in the description down below. Either way, guys, thank you so much for watching this one, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.